Good evening, everyone, my distinguished colleagues at the head table, ladies and gentlemen, fellow participants at this conference. I was described as a historian, but really my qualifications are in anthropology. But I apply anthropology to a study of our human society and uh, its uh, course through history. And it is for this reason that I am particularly interested in the human reaction within our islands to, um, to disasters of this kind and of all kinds. So it's a combination of a historical analysis and an anthropological study of how people think about these disasters. And for this, we're going to understand first the pre-Columbian people. I know that we often, in our analysis of uh, societies in the Caribbean, tend to forget those people who occupied these islands for 2,000 years, when we, who are either descendants of Africans or Europeans or a mixture of both, have only been here for maybe, at most in the Eastern Caribbean, about 300 years in comparison to the 2,000 years that others have occupied these islands. And once these original people paddled their canoes past Tobago and entered the Lesser Antilles, the Amerindians were in many ways entering a new world. It was a new world because once they passed Tobago, here were volcanoes and sulfur springs as the islands sit along the edge of the Caribbean tectonic plate. There were coral reefs with a whole range of new resources that did not exist in the muddy waters of the South American coastline. And there were these furious annual visitations of swirling winds, thunderstorms, and driving rain north of 12 degrees north latitude. Much of this is anchored, for their case, in myth. Mythical stories are ways of explaining and marking beliefs and experiences. The Tainos of Hispaniola use the word huragan to describe these storms, which the Spanish and French adopted and which became hurricane in English. A few days before Maria, I took a hike in the Kalinago territory. And a few days afterwards, I attempted to find roughly the same place. And the comparison is clear to see what the indigenous people would have experienced. In the Taino myth, recorded by Father Penny in the Greater Antilles, the Uragan was guided by a powerful female spirit, Guaban Kex, the Lady of the Winds. She had two assistants, Guatabai, who produced the hurricane force winds, and Quatrisqui, who caused the flood waters. Anyone who experienced Hurricane Maria last year will understand how the Tainos saw the two forces working together, the powerful winds and the raging waters. In these islands to the southeast, the Kalinago had their own names for the cycles of tropical waves from May to October and a variation on the Uragan itself. As generation followed generation along this archipelago, the settlers and their descendants adapted themselves to become an island culture, rather than that of a continental society. They amassed a knowledge of environmental signals that informed them of approaching hurricanes. They developed a cycle of life in tune with the seasons and evolved a fantastic knowledge of the nature of the islands, much of which is now lost. Today, because of colonization and so-called modernization and development, we are in many ways divorced from many of the realities of our island world. Amerindian construction methods adapted to these requirements. Knowledge of woods, the different types of woods and their different qualities, the use of maho bark cord in a society where there was no metal for the making of nails and bolts. The early chroniclers of European settlement marveled at the strength and intricate nature and designs of the maho cord bindings which tied together all of the components of the Amerindian house. 
main posts to rafters, rafters to frame, frame to purlines, and tying down of the thatch. We still use in the Creole uh, communities some of these phrases to differentiate the different types of maho. Maho pima, maho maon, and a whole list of others. Even if much of the thatch may have been stripped off during hurricanes, the tightly connected frames survived to be rethatched immediately after the storm. This resilience of the early native architecture was seen after Hurricane Maria at the Kalinago Barana Aute in the Kalinago Territory in northeastern Dominica. And it means the Kalinago village by the sea. And this entire complex was actually financed by the Caribbean Development Bank. And it shows, and I was there on Sunday, as members of the Kalinago community were using the opportunity of Maria to rethatch the frames had stood secure and firm. Many of the buildings that you see there were totally um, standing firm with no problem whatsoever, a little thatch missing, and that was it. It's up and going and ready to go as the next tourist season approaches, or maybe the next Uragan. Transfer of knowledge of woods and building techniques from dwindling Amerindians to European and African arrivals after 1492 was an important aspect of contact and culture exchange, which influenced the design and materials used in the Creole house. In the Creole of um, our French influenced islands, the Cai Creole, every part of that diagram uh, has a particular type of wood, uh, whether it is um, Balata, Bois Rivier, Bois Setan, Noyer, or um, the pillar trees down at the bottom with Mang, Mang Blanc, Akakwa. All of the different parts of the house are recorded as having been used for particular strengths. A lot of this is taken from the original Kalinago origins. You see this little picture here. And you see the props, which are the remains of the A-frame Kalinago house that you saw before, which during Creole times were put on the houses before hurricanes to ensure that they stood firm. Interestingly enough, in Maria, those few houses in the Kalinago territory that maintained their props stood up and did not turn over. So it shows that some of these elements are still important in our resilience. This was evident in the transfer of building knowledge between the Taino and Spanish settlers in early Jamaica, and even in islands such as Barbados, where no Amerindians were found when the English arrived, Tupinamba Indians were brought to Barbados from Brazil by the Dutch to assist the English in both tropical food supply, natural resource use, and building construction. In those more rugged islands, such as the Windwards and Jamaica, that were not totally denuded of their forest during colonization, the knowledge of the qualities and use of timber survived into the 20th century. In the French-influenced colonies of the Eastern Caribbean, the Kalinago Tabui, the large communal men's house, sometimes called the Grand Cabe, was adapted to become the Maison de Met, the master's house. In this way, Amerindian houses were adapted to provide shelter for pioneer European settlements. These were the first houses of colonization. And this house right here, Bois Cotlet, photographed in 1905, withstood totally the winds and force of Maria, untouched, as in that photograph taken over a hundred years ago. Now, in the construction of these houses, then as now, there are a number of conflicting uh, challenges designed for through ventilation during normal times, and it was to adapt the house to two opposite requirements, unrestricted air ventilation under normal weather conditions, while at the same time being able to convert the building into hurricane mode when the sudden need arose in those days when there was no hurricane warning, 
You had to be able to shut up your house within 15 minutes as the storm came towards you. And that's why we have the heavy duty shutters, the bars, uh, and of course, the strong roofs to supply. We lost a lot of these uh, techniques, uh, the uh, jalousies, the louvers, and particularly the heavy duty, the heavy duty uh, window um, covers. And here in one village alone, the village of Benz in North Dominica, and this particular building right over here in the right, uh, the features of these early houses, the previous ones I showed you, one of these features was the cachot, the small strong room to resort to if the rest of the house is being destroyed. These bunkers were of heavy duty wood or of stone and were used for storage during the rest of the year. The experience of people in Maria retreating to their toilets during the recent hurricanes is an example to re-examine that secure room concept. And leading contractors in Dominica have said that uh, whether you choose your kitchen or you choose your bathroom, build it like a bunker so that you know there is a place that you can retreat to. And um, the head of disaster management in Dominica has also recently made this point, and this point was made by you just a short while ago. So we are, we are realizing that those early uh, settlers adapting the Kalinago strength of the central core of the house had something uh, to go with. The production and use, uh, well, it was... Um, during the plantation period that the greatest strength was put into the most valuable industrial investments such as sugar mills, water mills and boiling houses and public buildings. It was very fortuitous that crop time on sugar plantations did not coincide with the hurricane season. It lasted from January to the beginning of June so that windmill sails and frames could be taken down and stowed away, and other buildings and equipment could be secured and repaired for the rest of the year without loss of production. These cycles and the way they fit with each other is interesting. The production of limestone mortar locally, in rather than imported cement, involved gathering reef coral and mining limestone on those islands where it occurred. The coral or limestone was heated in lime kilns, one of the best examples of which is at the base of Brimston Hill Fortress in St. Kitts. The lime, called La Chaux in the French islands, was added to sifted aggregate and molasses to create a malleable mortar. There was a massive oversupply of molasses on these islands as a byproduct of sugar and rum production. Molasses within the mortar made it more plastic, it dried more slowly, um, and was easier to work. The biochemical nature of limestone mortar made it uh, continue to bind naturally over the years after it was laid down, um, and it constituted itself almost into its original form when it had been mined. Fortifications were of prime concern during those years of intercolonial conflict, and for security reasons, military buildings received the most professional attention by actual trained royal engineers. Here we find the strongest and most disaster resistant buildings that take into consideration all of the main natural threats of earthquakes, hurricanes, and flooding, apart from their primary role of withstanding bombardment. Great attention was given to drainage channels, sea defenses where those buildings needed to be along the seashore. The survival of many of these buildings today as converted public buildings and tourist attractions on our islands is therefore no coincidence. In, a, in the early 2000s, I designed and supervised the restoration of one such complex. I'm going to mention this because I don't deal only in theory. Um, the director of the national parks is here in this room, and over the years, uh, we have kept in touch the national parks, uh, or particularly the Cabritz National Park, 
to restore many of those buildings. Our team followed as closely as possible the historic plans and building techniques, and I am happy to say that it proved itself by surviving the forces of Hurricane Maria totally undamaged, except for some dented guttering and a split flagpole. This is during construction. Um, this was one that was demolished finally by Hurricane David, and then we restored it um, in 2012, 2013. It is now a popular um, hostel for uh, youth uh, groups uh, from Dominica, the region, and uh, further afield. And the techniques that we used were entirely traditional. I told somebody who was questioning, who is your engineer? I said, well, his name was Andrew Fraser, and sadly he died 250 years ago, but I am following his plan. <laughs> um, and so, except for um, the flagpole that you see here that got bent, this is the scene uh, taken by helicopter after Maria, a day or two after. You can see the destruction of the forest, and a, a, a few weeks later uh, from the mountain top. So it just shows that if you maintain a building and if you use those traditional methods, uh, your buildings really can stand strong. In domestic houses, we see two main solutions to dealing with the edge of roofs and the realization that strength and protection was vital to ensure the security at the point of which the roof meets the outside wall. An early um, 18th century example are the buildings of St. George's Grenada, in this photograph taken in 1880, where steep, well-placed roofs extend in most cases no more than a few inches beyond the face of the wall. Double layers of clay tiles or wooden shingles strengthened these edges. There were hardly any verandas at that time because people were very suspicious of them being swept away. And if there was any need for extended covering, such as entrance porticos or canopies to protect the windows from sun or rain, these were clearly separated from the main roof. They were disposable. They could go. In Barbados, after the devastation of the 1831 hurricane, the parapet became widely introduced to shield the edge of the roof from the hurricane winds. This is the origin of this distinctive aspect of Bajan architecture, the parapet in the older houses and even in the churches. Large communal buildings, such as churches, provided some of the greatest challenges to architects and engineers at the time, particularly in the case of the Western European-style church steeples and towers, which were subject to threat by hurricanes and, of course, by earthquakes. Although we tend to concentrate um, I just want to point out, this is something I'll be talking about later, the colonial development and, and welfare housing, uh, which paid a great deal of attention to ventilation, but this is the same building in 1955 and in 1979. Uh, that challenge of getting natural ventilation without use of, of air conditioning, as well as at the same time ensuring that your buildings are strong. Although we tend to concentrate on hurricanes, there is an impressive record of earthquake and volcanic damage that we must not forget. As an archaeologist, also in pre-Columbian times, we have three archaeological sites so far in the Eastern Caribbean where villages were covered by volcanic debris, pre-Columbian villages, at Vive in northern Martinique, in Dominica in 450 AD, and at Trance in Montserrat at about the same period. And at Trance, over a thousand years later, it came and recovered the original settlement in that plain down there on the east coast. During the historic historical period, we have the destruction of communities and ash falls on buildings in St. Vincent in 1812, 1902, and 1979. 
In Dominica, the capital of Roseau was covered uh, by a phreatic volcanic eruption in 1880. Martinique, in 1902, of course, the famous eruption of Montagne Pele that wiped out the city of Saint Pierre and killed some 30,000 people. And the evacuation of 70,000 people in Bastia, Guadeloupe in 1976, and the devastation of southern Montserrat and its capital, Plymouth, from 1995. A visit, I was taking a picture of the beautiful house. And then in 2005, I went with the Minister of Communications and Works into Plymouth, and I took a picture of the same house, but from a higher level. And tragically, that is totally gone now. But it gives you an understanding of the volume of ash and debris, pyroclastic flow, that will cover our cities if there is such a volcanic eruption. And how do you build or plan for that? Earthquake damage has been relatively common all along the chain, with the worst recorded in Guadeloupe in 1843 with the destruction of Point Apit, and Jamaica in 1692 and 1907, and of course Haiti in 2010. These are definitely not to be ignored. That's another view of Plymouth. Those are gone as well, Barclays Bank and the other public buildings. The location of post-emancipation settlements, which we have inherited, are usually the most disaster-prone areas due to the fact that they were located on marginal land unwanted by the plantations. They are on narrow strips of shoreline subject to storm surge, on dangerous slopes subject to land slippage, and at the mouths and along the banks of ravines that become raging torrents during storms. Our present-day physical planners are faced with issues of disaster mitigation in settlements that were laid down haphazardly some 180 years ago. And this year is the 180th anniversary of slave emancipation and the beginning of the squatting and settlement that created free villages. Scientific weather studies at the end of the 19th and early 20th century provided a greater understanding of tropical weather patterns. The laying down of underwater cable telegraph service at the end of the 19th century extended across the Caribbean. Together, they provided some basic form of advance warnings to the authorities, who could then issue rudimentary alerts by way of raising hurricane flags and firing warning cannons within sight and sound of the main urban areas. Cables would be sent from, let's say, Barbados or Grenada, saying, we have this terrible storm, it's moving north, and the governors and administrators of places like Antigua, Dominica, and Nevis, uh, St. Kitts, would then uh, get proactive and try to issue warnings. But then, of course, the hurricane could divert before it reached there. So it was a haphazard method. The compilation and study of hurricane statistics in that same time influenced the introduction of hurricane insurance by Henry Head of Lloyd's of London. Some level of forewarning and a modicum of financial security continually relaxed and encouraged the profusion of verandas and extended overhangs in house design. So we see the changes beginning. The needs of the tourism industry in the 20th century also influenced more open and vulnerable design. In the British Caribbean, government housing and public buildings was revolutionized by the recommendations contained in the famous Moyne Commission report that severely condemned the state of working class housing and paucity of social services and the conditions under which education, healthcare, and administration in these colonies were delivered. It transformed public construction from 1945 at the end of the Second World War. Millions of pounds of Colonial Development and Welfare Funds, CDWF, went into the construction of more secure buildings in the island. Here in St. Lucia, there was the added impact of the destruction of much of Castries by the disastrous fire of 1948. 
the public architecture of CD&W funded buildings and of the Commonwealth Development Corporation CDC housing can still be seen in Castries. In fact, the housing district of Castries is simply called CDC <laughs> as a result of that. In this way, British architects, trained mainly to provide tropical African colonial architecture, left their mark across our region, most notably in the earliest layout of buildings of Mona Campus at the University of the West Indies and at St. Augustine in Trinidad. But their focus of design was more on ventilation than hurricane resistance. And when the spate of severe hurricanes came after the 1950s, many of these buildings were severely tested. And to some degree, were found wanting. How they became increasingly influenced by the culture of the United States after the 1940s, this infatuation fell into our building design. The effect of cheaper and in many cases weaker imported mass-produced building material, as well as the influence of the tropical bungalow house designed in Florida after the 1940s, all had its impact on Caribbean house construction. This was a time when suburban housing schemes were spreading rapidly along the capital cities. In Trinidad, it was called by some the Deco Martin style. <laughs> and the traditional methods of West Indian architecture, such as, well, now they're having the influence of trained uh, architects and uh, concrete roofs. These are actually from the 1970s, and they introduced also a new pattern of public architecture. Some of these historic buildings, in this case, a Methodist church in uh, the north of Grandina, before Maria and after Maria. It is a talking point for people in that district, the fact that it stood up so strong, even without windows. <laughs> The traditional methods of West Indian architecture, such as steep, heavily braced roofs and thick wooden shutters and doors, aimed at hurricane resistance, went into decline, and disaster mitigation moved into a format that was directed by professional university trained engineers using post mid 20th century techniques and materials. Both are valid approaches to facing these disasters. <laughs> but in concluding, I would urge that our engineering and architectural students should have a grounding in the Caribbean history of disaster mitigation and the materials and techniques of construction on these islands over the last 500 years. Not just merely an understanding of present conditions and present materials and present skills, but it enhances our knowledge and awareness of both engineering and architecture if we study the history of our resistance to hurricanes, earthquakes, and other natural disasters. Thank you. And just, just to end, one does not want to boast, <laughs> but this is the house I designed for myself the day before and the day after Maria. So there are elements that I have talked about, um, roof shape, um, the uh, not joining one section of roof to the other, the old time heavy duty shutters and jalousies, uh, stores of water, a gallon stores, many thousand gallon stores of water, and um, very tightly uh, riveted on uh, solar panels. I felt very embarrassed because across the way was the village totally destroyed. But when they came to help me get out through the bush, I told them, everybody can come. You have cold water, you have ice, you can link up to your um, internet, not internet really, but your cell phones. And um, that was my form of community service. <laughs> Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>